Relationships can be uh, confusing sometimes. And I have to read this because I can't keep track of it myself. I came across this information. 76-year-old Bill Baker was recently wedded to Edna Harvey. Edna happened to be Bill's granddaughter's husband's mother. Follow? In an interview, Baker's granddaughter, Lynn, explained, My mother-in-law is now my step-grandmother. My grandfather is now my stepfather-in-law. My mom is my sister-in-law. My brother is my nephew. But even crazier is that I'm now married to my uncle and my own children are my cousins. <laughs> no chance. Got that memorized? See if it's right or not? I need to study it myself to figure that out there right. If you think that's confusing, just consider the confusion and the pain and the trouble there are in the world of relationships when the ingredients of grace and forgiveness are not present. The Old and New Testament readings celebrate in common the importance of forgiveness. The reading from Genesis tells of Joseph and his brothers. They sold him off to be, they thought, a servant somewhere down in Egypt. He sold him to a caravan. They were jealous of how he had been favored by his father, Jacob. Expecting he would become a servant slave somewhere in Egypt, and however, his fate turned out to be markedly different, and he ascended to a position of leadership instead. And when years later, there was a famine, and Jacob and his sons, the remaining sons, moved down to the area of Egypt to survive from the famine. Uh, Joseph forgave his brothers when they expected punishment instead when he recognized them and would remember what they had done to him. And I just remember reading this in seminary at a time when it meant so much to me to hear these words and they've always been special, special to me ever since. Joseph said, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. Really turns it around, transforms it. Joseph was an optimist. He was trusting that God can bring good out of times of pain and trouble, but he also realized that forgiveness is often the gateway that needs to be open in order to let the good come forward and make a difference. Forgiveness is one of the key signs of an optimist. Pessimists have great trouble both in receiving or giving true, sincere, durable, lasting forgiveness that isn't dug up later on like a buried hatchet and repeated over and over. I first came across the thought that forgiveness is one of the key signs of an optimist years ago. When reading some of the works of eminent psychologist Rollo May, Carl Menninger, and Viktor Frankl, to mention just a few. What these psychotherapists had observed during years of clinical practice and research, I found to my pleasure, was also confirmed in the teachings of the Bible and by Jesus in particular. In the reading from Matthew today, Jesus teaches Peter, his disciple, that when there's a need for it, forgiveness should never be withheld. Should I always, should have no limits. Burying a hatchet, calling it forgiveness, and then digging it up later is not what forgiveness is about at all. It's our struggle with trying to do it. True forgiveness is not given and then taken back. Like the giving of any kind of gift, you have to let go of it so the other can really receive it. And have it. And possess it and walk away with it. And you're just happy that they have it. The act of forgiveness between people is the very hope of relationships that last and grow deeper since no one of us is perfect. Without learning and giving and receiving forgiveness, people push each other away, allowing anger, resentment, and disappointment and past wounds to control their lives. What really 
wants anger, who really wants anger and resentment and disappointments to gain the upper hand and be like little gods in one's life. And dictating one's relationships when indeed we know that Jesus knows a much better way that brings people together. An optimist believes in and knows there is a bright future possible once one removes the road, whatever the roadblocks are, the detours, the disappointments, the hurts, the negative emotions that get in the way. Withholding forgiveness is a major roadblock, block rather, a detour and a disappointment that really holds things up like a traffic jam, stops us from moving forward, keeps the door closed to realizing God's bright, optimistic, meaningful future for people, for ourselves, and for our relationships with them. I have never met anyone who never needs to be forgiven by others. <laughs> I've never met anyone who does not need to give their forgiveness to others. When you're tempted to cut off forgiveness and give up on someone, choosing instead to harbor ill feelings and to lug them around, that is the very time you need to struggle most inside, hopefully discovering how to let go of the baggage. Becoming a giver of the gift of grace that God gives to you all the time. Writer Max Lucado tells the story of a boy named Johnny shooting rocks with a slingshot in his grandmother's backyard. He was missing all of his intended targets, but he accidentally hit his grandmother's pet duck, of all things. That's the way the story reads, which died in the accident. Hiding the evidence in a wood pile, he looked up and saw Sally, his sister taking it all in. After lunch that day, Grandma told Sally to help with the dishes, to which Sally was quick to reply, Oh, Johnny will, uh, told me he wanted to work in the kitchen today, didn't you, Johnny? As she whispered to him, Remember the duck. As she whispered. So Johnny did the dishes for several weeks on end. He was at the sink doing dishes. And whenever he objected, Sally whispered, Remember the duck. <laughs> How sad it is for anyone to be a slave to guilt. Finally, Johnny had enough dishwashing. He finally confessed the duck about the duck to his grandmother, and giving him a hug, she said, I know, Johnny. I was standing in the window and saw the whole thing. <laughs> because I love you. I forgave you then. I was wondering how long you would let Sally make a slave of you. How sad it is for anyone to be a slave to guilt. When one has already been pardoned, we all need to know and receive the gift of God's grace, forgiveness, love for our human failings and then be lifted by that by God's optimism about who we are and who we can become. God is an optimist. We're lovable and capable because at great price God says so. God is an uncompromising optimist even when we are not, about ourselves as well as about others. Likewise, in a book of wisdom stories from around the world, which is a little book by that title on my bookcase. The story is told of two friends crossing the desert sand when they fell into an argument and one slapped the other. The one suffering the pain wrote in the sand, Today my best friend slapped me in the face. Continuing to walk together, they later arrived at an oasis where one could cool off in the sandy marsh created by a spring of water. The one previously injured jumped right in and found it was a sinkhole of collapsing sand and mud. His friend threw him a rope and hauled him out. Now he rode upon a rock 
Today, my best friend saved my life. When asked why he wrote in the sand the first time and on a rock the second time, he replied, When someone hurts you, you should write it in the sand, so that the wind of forgiveness can erase it away. And when someone does good, we must engrave it on a stone, where no wind can blow it away. Learning to forgive the bad and preserving and building upon the good that people do, including ourselves, is the sign of an optimist. I always believe things can get better. It is as simple and as difficult to do as that, but why choose to spend the valuable time of your life, or my life, or the lives of others in any other way? There is a poem by one James Kinney that describes a group of people perishing on a bitterly cold night around a campfire, they were always all holding a log in their hand, but they refused to put it in the fire because they didn't really want to do that for each other. Each one having objections to certain others present in the group, refusing to contribute their logs to the fire. The last verse of the poem reads something like this, depicting the scene the next morning after all had perished in the bitter cold. The logs held right in their stilled hands was proof of human sin. They didn't die from the cold without. They died from the cold within. You know, Goethe, the artist, once is known for his famous quotation that the world will not end in fire next time. It will end because of its being a lack of warmth, is the way he put it. One form of global warming that would be most welcome these days, in the days of many polarities and tensions between people, not just politicians, but people all over, is the warmth of people. That would be a form of global warming most welcome these days. The warmth of people and nations who learn both to receive and to give forgiveness. To have that be their relationship. Some know these words in music, and you perhaps saw, uh, actually we broke into singing them briefly at the council meeting last month. Uh, it only takes a spark. I know C, A minor, F, and G are the chords that work for that, unless you... Would you like to play that for... If you want to. For the, uh, I can do the, uh, the author card. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, it goes the... It only takes a spark you get to get a fire going. And it only takes a spark, a spark to get a fire going. And then all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, it's fresh like spring. You want to sing. You want to pass. On. And in other words, it says, join me now as friends and celebrate the fellowship we have. All is one. Keep that fire burning. Kindle it with care and we'll all join in and sing. It only takes a spark to set a fire going. from your forgiveness today, do it for them. Give it to them. Do it for you. Most of all, do it for the glory, letting God's kind of love be known. That's what you're doing when you do it. As God has made known God's optimism about you, share the optimism with others around. They're all people God's optimistic about. 
So, the title was, So Be an Optimist. God is. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your presence in our lives, and we thank you for never giving up on us, for showing us the way back when we wander away, for correcting us when we make mistakes, for giving us a wisdom far beyond our own. Help us to be faithful to your word to us and uh, your inspiration to strengthen us in doing what we pray. Amen. Amen.